Hey, welcome back, everybody, this week. We're so glad to be with you. This is the online version. We are trying to meet outside today, weather permitting. And if you couldn't have made that, I'm just glad that you can be with us here on the broadcast. Uh, and I hope that you're safe. And we know uh, that we love you. And I hope you know we're praying for you. Uh, and anybody who might be at risk or vulnerable, or maybe you just have uh, very young children, we're just so happy that you're part of our church and connected this way. And hopefully soon we'll be able to, to come out of this time. This morning, we're continuing our series called Messy, Loving Others Isn't Easy. And I don't know about you, but that title says it all. all and we actually switched to this series a few weeks before it started because we just felt like, man, with everything going on, COVID-19, uh, close quarters, we need to hear from God's Word in this area, messy. And plus, I just think it really goes with our vision really well. We're trying to become a compelling presence for Christ. And part of the way we do that is by loving others, by following these great commands. Uh, Dustin talked about the Good Samaritan last week and loving our neighbor. Uh, and this is so hard, and especially when they're difficult people. I don't know if you've seen the segment, probably you have, called Some Good News by John Krasinski. I thought about, you know, wearing a suit on top and maybe some Bahama shorts on the bottom to mimic that, but I didn't want to do that. And if you saw that video, you know that it was made to inspire us during these sort of difficult times, to make us laugh, to, to make us cry, uh, but ultimately to give us some good news. And this morning, I want to give us some good news. I want to talk about some good news, and it's specifically through an awesome true story of a little man named Zacchaeus. And if you've been around the church, you know this story, but hopefully there'll be some fresh light on it today by God's Spirit. And I'd like to pray right now for that end. Lord, thank you for everybody tuning in. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that transcends time and space, that you can be connecting our hearts, your holy church, that we're still together, even if we're apart. And for those who couldn't come to the outside, doors service this morning, that you would just bless them in every way. Or if they're relatives and people who used to attend our church connecting from abroad, uh, from further away, uh, show them your love today. Speak to them uh, by your powerful, powerful Holy Spirit. And speak through the scriptures and use me. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The story we're talking about Zacchaeus is found in Luke 19, 1 through 10. If you want to follow along, you can always use the version event on your smartphones or just follow along on a paper Bible or however you're comfortable. But this story needs to be set up before I read it. And here's how I would do that. This is the context. If you were to put Zacchaeus into today's world, this is, this is how you would have to think about it to understand what's happening here with Zacchaeus and why it is that he's just so despised. And here would be the context. Imagine today if America were invaded, we were taken over, and not only that, but just completely overwhelmed by our most hated enemy, whoever that would be. You could fill in the blank for yourself. And this enemy was so powerful that we became almost non-existent. We were still living under their rule, but now we had no rights, and we were second-class citizens, and this other nation was just taking over everything. How horrible would that be? And now, to put it into more context for Luke 19, imagine that you know a man named Zach. He's a fellow American, but he happens to be a financial wizard. He's really good with numbers, probably the best you know. And instead of helping out your cause, Zach goes immediately to work for this foreign invading nation. And he just gives up all of his friends and relatives to go and work. And really, people would see him as a traitor. But to make things worse, not only does he go to work for them and do their taxes and do their numbers and do their accounting and, and, and just raise up money for them, but he turns on his fellow countrymen. And the way of collecting money is I'm going to give $1 to the invading nation, and I'm going to put $1 in my pocket. $1 for them, $1 for me. That's literally how he would have done it. And as a result, he becomes mega rich, mega rich relative to the time period, and you become very poor. In fact, all of your people become very 
poor. You're just meagerly eking out an existence. Meanwhile, your old friend Zach is living on the biggest mansion on the hill, drinking the finest wines and eating caviar and driving the best luxury cars. What would you think about him? That is the setting. Let me read to you Luke 19, 1 through 10. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. But the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I find this story filled with some good news. And I would like to give you four pieces of some good news this morning. They are parts of this amazing good news, the big good news, the news, which is called the gospel. And I also think that they are good news for those listening in, especially if you've never received Jesus as your Savior or you don't know who He is. I hope you especially are prayerful and open to this message today, but for all of us to be excited about what Christ has already done for us. And here's the first piece of good news. Jesus cares about bad people. That's right. That's really good news. I don't know about you, but I find that to be really good news for myself. I find it to be good news for the people I know. I find it to be tremendously good news for our church family. He cares about bad people. That's at the heart of the story. That's kind of what the story is all about. But it's also why people didn't like it. They didn't like what happened here, as you saw and heard in the text. Now, Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector. He, in the text, says he was a chief tax collector. He wasn't just taking money out of the pockets of the poor people. He was doing that in a bit of a Ponzi scheme way where he was getting money from lower tax collectors as well. He was so rich, he probably didn't even know what to do with all of his money. I heard about a businessman who went to his deathbed, and he asked his friend to, to take care of his arrangements. And he said, uh, what shall I do with your body? He said, I'd like you to cremate it. And he said, what should I do then? And he said, well, I'd like you to take my ashes and put them in an envelope and mail them to the IRS. And he said, then put a little note attached which says, now I have given you everything. Now, this little story was a joke because I Googled jokes about IRS. And when you do that, you'll find a lot of jokes about the IRS, not really surprisingly. And even today, we don't like tax collectors. We don't like the IRS. And if you're part of the IRS, I'm so sorry for offending you. Um, I didn't mean to do that, but it's true. People, there were more jokes probably about the IRS when I Googled it than there were about lawyers. Um, and I'm sorry if you're a lawyer. Keith Teague, I'm looking at you because there are many jokes about you as well. But in the Bible days, it wasn't just like an IRS agent. A tax collector was despised for the reason that I've already outlined. And here's the difference. The Jewish people who were being subjugated by the Romans, and they were under their rule, they believed that a Jewish tax collector who would go and work for the Romans could no longer be saved. That's what they believed. It was part of their theology. They didn't believe that about other types of people. They literally believed that Zacchaeus could not go to heaven, that he could not receive salvation, that, that he, he was not part of God's plan. He was so far removed. He was a bad, bad person beyond redemption. And maybe you felt like that yourself. 
you're not a tax collector, but you've sinned. Everybody has. And maybe you know the sting of that sin, and you've wondered if you're beyond redemption. Of course, Jesus shows us here in the story. I know he intentionally goes to Zacchaeus' house to show to everybody, I love bad people. I don't wait for people to get all cleaned up. I, I, I know that it, it's the sick who need a doctor. He said that in the gospel. I, I know that they need the love of, of, of Christ himself through, uh, through what the Father has done and ultimately through his death on the cross. This is why I came. This is what I'm here to do. Now, some people are on the other side. They, they kind of, they're like the people in the story, like, oh, that's such a bad person. Jesus, don't go and dine with him. He's not worth your time, and it make you evil if you do it. They just saw guilt by association. And part of that is this theology says, well, I'm a really good person. That's why I love Jesus. But that is not what the Bible teaches. It doesn't say if you're a really good person, you'll love Jesus. It says if you're a really bad person, but you understand it, you can repent and turn to Jesus because we're all really bad people. I'm convinced the reason they didn't like this story is because it threw their theology out of whack. How can you go and help a bad person? You're supposed to help the good people. Imagine for a moment that a new device has been created, God forbid, and this new device is wired into your cell phone, but there's also an implant in your brain, and this new device records every sin you ever do throughout the day for all of your life, and it records it on your cell phone, and it automatically uploads it to a YouTube channel called Your Life. And it's recording only the evil things. It's recording every bad word, every bad thought, every bit of gossip, every bit of slander, every bad thought, every lustful look. It's recording them all, and it's putting it all online. If that terrible device existed, I'm pretty sure no one would come out of quarantine because you would not want to show your face anywhere. You'd be so ashamed. And I believe that would be true for every person on planet earth because we're sinful people. And when Jesus came, he said, I, I, I've come to remedy this problem. I, I've not come so that you could get all cleaned up and come to me. I've come because I love broken people. I love even bad people. He loves us. Number two, Jesus came to fill the empty places in our lives. Some good news. Jesus came to fill the empty and lonely places in our lives. Think about Zacchaeus. Yes, he's super wealthy. That sounds great. Maybe it sounds appealing. But the reality is he had to do it at the expense of his own soul. He had to do it at the expense of his social life. He was a social pariah. Nobody liked him. He lost all of his friends. He probably lost all of his family, too. He was lonely. He was desperate. And he had amassed all of this wealth, probably relative to the time period, so much money, he probably didn't know what to do with it all. And he found out what everybody finds out if they get to that point. It was not enough to satisfy what was broken in his heart. And now, in desperation and loneliness... He runs. He runs to Jesus. That's what the text says. It says he runs when he hears Jesus is coming by because he doesn't want to miss him. And then even crazier, he climbs a tree and he gets up on this tree and he's trying to look to see why. Because he's desperate for love and affection. He wants anything that will fill the broken part of his life. Maybe you understand this pain. Maybe you've yet to find Christ, and this morning's the day that he's knocking on the door of your heart, and it's time to let him in. And when you do, you'll find out what Zacchaeus did, that he will give you what you've been looking for. And I can attest to that in my own life, that he has filled me up and given me that satisfying, abundant life that he promises to take away your fears, your sins, your hurts, your heartaches, your brokenness, to give you peace. Not a perfect life, but a good life, this side of heaven. Now, when the Bible describes Zacchaeus, 
they, the writers use one word. Luke uses one word, really, to describe. It's really the only description that he's given. And everybody who's heard the story knows that it's that he's short. And when you look that word up in the original, it's actually the Greek word micros. Like, it just, wow, that's the word that you're going to use for me? Micros. Like, micro. He's tiny. It's not even just short. It's like, he, he apparently really was a wee little man. Like, this is the tiny little person. Um, not just short. I mean, I'm kind of short. This guy probably was, like, really small. And I was just thinking about Zacchaeus, you know. He's, imagine you were in the Bible. There's a story about you. And imagine there's only one word that the Bible writer uses to describe you. What would it be? Well, the word they chose for Zacchaeus is micros. And probably Zacchaeus, now up in heaven rejoicing with Jesus, he, he's, he knows about this story, and he's probably thinking, Lord, you know, you could have chosen another description. Uh, like, look at my long, wavy hair, you know, that's one of my best features. Or look at this nose, you know, my mother gave me this nose. Or, like, look at my great fashion sense. These, these sandals are Gucci, and I spent hundreds of dollars on them. Anything to tell the world about, but micros, that's the word. He has no friends. He has, he's hated by others. And the word they describe him is micros. So when Jesus comes to town, he does what no respectable Jewish man would ever do. He runs. They did not run in those days, especially wearing these robes. He would have tucked that robe up and run with it. It would have looked awkward and silly. And they definitely don't climb trees, but he climbed a tree because he's desperate for the love of Jesus. He wants it in his life, and he doesn't probably even know why. So that's where we find him. And I find it interesting, too, that it's despite the fact of his great wealth. There was a big research study done in 2018 from the journal nature of human behavior. I don't know if anyone's heard of this, but this study, it evaluated the satisfaction levels of people at various uh, amounts of wealth. And what it found out, I'd say rather definitively, is that it is true that very poor people were unsatisfied until they got to a certain amount of money. It was basically like a, a middle class income. And at that point, they, they became slightly more satisfied. But what the study also found out is that when you made more than that amount, especially significantly more, your satisfaction with life actually started to go down. And I think there's a bit of a be careful what you wish for in this, that we all think, well, I, I'd be better off if I just had a little more money, if I had more of my 401k or I had a nicer house or a bigger garage or whatever it is you want, more travel. But the reality is you might actually find yourself to be less satisfied. But the greater truth, and some good news is, the only way to be truly satisfied is through Jesus Christ and what He can give you in the deeper life by His Holy Spirit. Number three, the third piece of good news is this. If we seek Him, He will find us. Now, you've heard the Bible saying, if you seek Him, He'll find you, and that's true. But I want to say this. From this story, we see a different angle. We see if we seek Him, He'll find us us, not just that we'll find him. And that's exactly what happened with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a seeker in the truest sense of that word. And that, I know that word seeker became a buzzword in the 80s around churches, and some people don't like the word, but it's right here in the text. It actually describes him in the original language as someone who is seeking out. And then later at the end of the passage, verse 10, it says that Jesus came to seek and save those who are lost. So both are seekers. Zacchaeus is a seeker because there's something desperately wrong with his life. And Jesus is a seeker. He is honing in like a heat-sinking missile to find the person whose heart is open. And that's it. And it's so relevant that in the text, it doesn't say that we often hear the story that Zacchaeus invited him into his house. And it was scandalous because Jesus went. That's not actually what it says. It says that Jesus invited himself. He said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming over. Listen, buddy, micros, little man, I'm coming over, so get ready for me. 
Now, don't hear it wrong. Jesus never forces his way into our lives. He doesn't push or co coerce, but he does invite himself. It's as if he's just right there. He's knocking on the door of your heart right now, and he lets you choose. Zacchaeus could have stiff-armed. He could have said, nope. He had all the power in the world to say, nope, you're not coming to my house. But Jesus already knows. That's why he's up in the sycamore fig tree. He knows that he's receptive. He knows that he needs something. He's inviting him to have a relationship, and he is changed forever because he receives Christ. If you're a person leaning into this broadcast this morning, maybe you stumbled over it, maybe you're just listening over somebody else in the room, and maybe you're starting to dial in because you're like Zacchaeus too. No, you're not a wee little man, but you're... You're looking for something. You're desperate for something. You're, 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 you're missing something. What would it hurt you to lean in to God's Word this morning? What would it hurt your life to call out to God and investigate and see if He will answer? Because I already know He's right there waiting. That's why you're listening this morning. That's why you're tuning in. It's Jesus through His Scripture, by His Spirit who wants you in his family. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to dine with you. He wants you to have a full, rich, and satisfying life beyond what you have now. But it is going to take your agreement. That's all Zacchaeus had to do. That's all he had to do was say, yeah, of course, Lord, I will make room in my house for you. And then when you do so, Christ comes in, and frankly, he becomes our Lord our Savior. He becomes the reason why we exist. He becomes the reason why we live. But the people in the text weren't happy about it. Verse 7 says, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Well, that's how the religious people were and sometimes still are today. They are not happy when the bad person is redeemed. We're not always happy in church when we see grace applied. Grace says you get what you don't deserve. It's not fair. But Jesus is the grace master. He's the grace giver, and he gave it ultimately through his sacrifice on the cross when he died in our place. That wasn't fair either. Jesus did the unthinkable. He was God who became man so that he could die in my place, in your place, so that I could have freedom and new life. But he also rose from the dead so that we could have victory and the hope of our own resurrection. The people didn't like Jesus being guest of a sinner. In fact, they started calling him a friend of sinners. He, he, he's the worst kind of person, the kind of person who hangs around with tax collectors. And sometimes he, he hung around with other people they considered social outcasts, and he gave them some good news, some really good news. And I think, again, it just violated their sense that they were good people and that they deserved it. And what Jesus came to show us is no one deserves it, but they get it anyways, and that's grace. We receive his love anyways. Now, I might ask you, who is the Zacchaeus in your life today? Not just are you that Zacchaeus. We all once were, and you might still be, but maybe you're a Christian, but you're still kind of looking at people with that eyeball that they had back then and judging them really harshly, rather than following the example of Jesus Christ, which says, I need to love messy people. Messy people matter because God loves messy people. And people who are seeking and who are open and who are willing to investigate, if they are broken, then I need to be the person who loves on them, even though it's going to be difficult. Who is that Zacchaeus in your life? Who is the person that is hard to love, but you see in them someone who's trying to seek Jesus Christ, someone trying to reach out to, and not you're not trying to treat them as a project or someone to be converted. You're loving them because God has called you to love them. That can be one of the hardest things in life to do, but God has asked us all to do that, and I believe it's the way we truly become a compelling presence for Christ. One of the chief ways is to love people even if it's difficult or even when it's difficult. And then fourth and finally, some good news is 
When Jesus comes into a person's life, he completely changes them. I mean, we're talking about a renovation of the heart. And we see that in verse 8. Zacchaeus isn't just making amends here, if you read that text. His response to Jesus' open offer for salvation, he says salvation is here, is not only I receive it, but Lord, I'm going to give half my money to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to pay them back four times the amount. Now, we already know this is a man who's cheated many people, so not only is he going to give away half his income, but... On top of that, he's going to give people back their money four times. That means he's probably going to go bankrupt. When Jesus comes in, he changes everything. And Zacchaeus knows that it's worth it. And he's willing to go bankrupt. He's willing to give it all away. He's willing to do what it takes to follow Jesus Christ. Are you this morning? Or has your faith become cold? Has it become distant? Has it become sort of... Blase. When Jesus comes in, it's a full renovation of the heart. Let him change you. Let him continue to change every part of you. After hearing a sermon about cheating, a man was very convicted. And so he wrote a letter to the IRS. And it said basically, hey, I, my pastor preached about cheating and I've cheated my taxes. And so I was very convicted. And enclosed in this envelope is $500. And it said, sincerely, tax collector. But then he wrote, P.S., if I continue to feel convicted, I'll send you the rest of the money. That's another bad IRS joke. I'm sorry. But it illustrates what life with Jesus doesn't look like. That is to say, when Jesus comes in, it's not a partial it's not a partial change. It's a complete and utter change. He, he doesn't get part of the money. He gets all the money. He doesn't get part of your life. He gets all of your life. He doesn't get part of your allegiance. He wants your worship. He doesn't want a few minutes of your time or just Sunday morning. He wants all of your hours, all of your minutes, all of your days. He wants you because He loves you and He made you. And you are made to worship Him. And we get to do that through believing in God, by trusting in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And that's my prayer for you. I hope you know this good news. Uh, I'm not sure how the recording is right now. I know that it's raining really hard in here, and I can't tell if it's being picked up. Uh, but hopefully that was not distracting for you. I just pray that you really know this God who loves broken people. He loves the bad people, but He loves them to life. He loves them to becoming part of His kingdom. He loves them into family to become sons and daughters of God. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank You that I'm forgiven. All of my sins, past, present, and future, were put on the cross with Jesus. Your blood covered all of them. And all I had to do was receive some good news the good news of the gospel, that your grace covered it all. And I pray for those listening, that they would receive your grace and they would truly become children of God, sons and daughters of the King. And if they already have, that they would just receive this with worship today, just a glad heart, more than just inspiration, but the deep, utter truth and reality that I got what I did not deserve when I trusted in Jesus Christ. I was the benefactor of all of the gifts and that we would just serve you with glad hearts as a result. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us online today. Uh, we just want to let you know again that we're praying for you. We trust that we're going to continue to come out of this virus. We pray that God will bring us back all together with our whole church family. And we can't wait to see you then. Have a great day.